That's fantastic. Okay. I'm really excited about this turnout. Um, hi, welcome. My name is Alex Champlin. Um, I'm a grad student in the Department of Film and Media Studies here, and I also work at the, uh, at the Carsey Wolf Center. I'm beyond excited to, uh, to, to be able to show this film and to have uh, Dave and Garth here uh, to talk about it. Um, so I'll quickly introduce both of them. Um, as you know, Dave is the director of Crystal Voyager. Uh, before this, he produced Morning of the Earth. Um, and he's also been extremely influential in the establishment of the new wave of Australian cinema, both as a producer and a director, um, with credentials that include working with Philip Noyce on Rabbit Proof Front Fence and Newsfront, um, and actors like Russell Crowe, Heath Ledger, um, and Jeffrey Rush. Um, and recently he's been working on a digital restoration of this film, which we've just seen. Um, Garth Murphy is a Californian, um, and a surfer, as well as an author and environmentalist, a friend of George Greenow's, um, and he worked closely with David on the um, post-production of CV. I should say a Californian by way of Hawaii. Um, and, uh, and so maybe as a way to sort of kick this off, tell us about the, uh, the restoration of this film, the, the sort of the process of, of bringing what we've, what we've seen here today. Well, the film was originally shot on 16mm positive film. And, uh, and it was blown up to 35 mil for cinema release. And that was done a long time ago, 1973. And so the film um, had lots of dirt on the negative, the 35 mil negative. So it was a process of cleaning all that dirt out. But um, we're very lucky that the National Film and Sound Archive in Australia had a lot of enthusiastic young uh, employees who uh, were supposed to finish their job on Crystal Voyager early February. Uh, they finished it last week, so um, <laughs> the taxpayers of Australia, I'm very grateful to them. And, uh, and th so it was great to see a film which was deteriorating to be so well, um, so well restored. And, uh, and also the soundtrack was restored as well. Um, I, I thought the Pink Floyd should have been louder, I've got to say. This is the first time I've heard it in a cinema, but um, that might be my ageing ears. Uh, was the Pink Floyd loud enough for you? Yes. No, no more bottom <laughs> end, I think, you know. Better in London. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was spectacular. Um, so to backtrack a, a, a ton, um, I'm curious, you know, where did this, this sort of the idea for Crystal Voyager, what was the sort of the, the genesis for this film? So I know um, before this you had worked first on a surf magazine called Tracks, and then um, as, a, as a producer on Morning of the Earth. And I'm curious where in that sort of process did you connect up with George Greenow um, and decide to come to, to California to, to film this? Well, uh, we started at Albie Falsam and I, who made Morning of the Earth together and made Crystal Voyager together as well. Um, we started a surfing magazine called Tracks in 1970, uh, 50 years ago next year. Um, and George was by far the most, Garth was one of the people that came through Tracks in its early days, but George was by far the most extraordinary original person I'd ever met in my life. I thought here is a genuine renaissance man who can put his mind to anything and create something. And uh, so George and I became very good friends and the Pink Floyd were touring Australia and uh, there was an artist in Australia called Martin Sharp who did the cover of Jimi Hendrix and the Cream albums and he started a version of the Van Gogh Yellow House in Sydney where, as an artist commune. And he said to me, we need something from surfing. And so I said, well, maybe I'll get George to give you the end of his film, The Innermost Limits of Pure Fun, which was again all inside of the wave. So in the middle of the Yellow House, they built a Magritte stone room, drill, uh, d recreated the Hokusai wave on one wall, and once an hour projected the coming of the dawn on the other wall. Anyway, the Pink Floyd were in Sydney. They went to see Martin because he was known in, in um, music circles, went and saw some George Greenough footage. So 
Um, that was the beginning of my relationship with George. And, uh, and then so we came to, when we finished Morning of the Earth, I came to California and showed George Morning of the Earth, which I've got to say one of the things about Morning of the Earth is it had no dialogue. And it, we had a, a, a guy called Albie Toms, who was a very famous Australian experimental filmmaker. Uh, Philip Noyce is in the audience tonight, and Philip was also a protege of Albie Toms, who started the Sydney Filmmakers Co-op, uh, which was an underground cinema movement. And so Morning of the Earth was influenced not only by surf films, but it was influenced in the whole avant-garde, abstract, underground cinema movement as well. So we, after Morning of the Earth, I showed it to George and there was a lot of things that were similar to Morning of the Earth and Innermost Limits of Pure Fun. And we began making a short film about George, which gradually developed into Crystal Voyager because the more we explored George's life, the more we wanted to, um, to make a feature film on him. And Garth, you were, so Garth was actually a, a UCSB graduate many, many, many years ago. I'm a um, sure. but, um, but when did you get connected with, uh, with this group? You, you know George sort of before the making of the film, but, um, but then connected with David in the, in the sort of post-production process in Australia. Mm -hmm. And there was a space of time there. I came to Santa Barbara in 1961 first and then went to visit the campus. I was going to high school in La Jolla and I saw that there was a surf spot on the campus <laughs> and a few around and Rincon, not too far away, decided to go to school here, which upset my father who was a scientist and wanted me to go to Berkeley where he had gone. And when I got here, I pretty soon ran into George because George was, as you can see, a what the Australians call a keen surfer. He would be there at dawn, and I like to get up early, and I'd be there. And we made friends <clears throat> at first, mainly because I, I had been required to learn to stand up on a mat before I could surf at Wind and Sea, which was my local spot in La Jolla. And the guys there didn't let the kids come surf there unless they somehow had proved that they deserved to go out there. So the first thing they told my brother and I was, you have to learn to ride a mat, and when you can stand up on it, then you can get aboard and come and surf wind and sea. So I did that, and that, um, my father had a couple of pictures of me standing on the mat. So when I showed them to George, all of a sudden, we were, we were, I don't know what you would call it, but we were, we were mat aficionados. And, uh, <laughs> and that was actually the height of my surfing career, I must add. But um, <laughs> I, uh, he, he's, an, as you can see, he's a highly unusual person. He was an artist in every way. He's extremely funny. Like, he, he would run these long jokes on you. He was very articulate, an artist who could explain what he was doing to just about anybody. And he, um, just like in the movie, I mean, he can talk about that fin that he made forever. And that was the first thing that really that surfers just picked up immediately. And we all cut our fins like that tuna fin that he invented because it worked better. But he himself in Santa Barbara was kind of, he was on the outer fringe. He was actually known more as a fisherman and um, a boatsman and, and a an inventor of everything. He drive a, drove a cop car, which you saw, which he never painted, except the way it was. And he could fix or do anything. He built everything himself that he had that you saw, all the camera housings, half the cameras, <laughs> his own car. He welded. He, you know, he saw it. He could, he could basically do anything. And he was extremely articulate. And therefore, he he was able to, to make his version of surfing explainable, especially um, to people who were good surfers, like Nat Young. And everybody followed him, I mean, as best as you could, because it wasn't easy. Yeah. I think that's one of the very interesting things about the film is that, you know, I mean, you've, you've said this sort of about Morning of the Earth, but 
um, it seems different than a lot of surf films in the sense that it, you know, it's focused on one place, Santa Barbara, and it's focused on um, on George Greenow and um, and Nat Young and and Richie West, but it's sort of it, you know through the perspective of of George and George's narration. How did that sort of focus develop, and how did that frame the way the the film was made? Well, the difficulty with George is. Um, it, he couldn't quite accept we were making a biopic about him. So he thought we were making a film about three different styles of surfing and he just happened to be building a boat in the background. Yeah. So um, uh, it, was, it, was, it took a while and, and we suggested the, a working title of George. And he said, oh, you can't call the film George. And I said, well, what are we going to call it? And he said, why don't we call it, the more the power grinds over your head, the less it lands on top of you. And I said, well, oh, <laughs> slightly long title. And um, so we, were, we, we thought we've got to get a title which symbolises what it's all about. And we're all working at Trax magazine on the deadline behind as usual. And um, we probably, there was probably recreational drugs involved, I'd say. <laughs> um, and uh, we put every word we could think of that was to do with the ocean and anything. We were all George Greeno in the George Greeno fan club. And then one of the guys just grabbed Crystal Voyager and said, that's it. And we thought, that's George, you know, that's yeah. what he is. And um, so that's how the thing evolved. But it was... It was so interesting working with George because, you know, we're from Australia and, and the early 70s was an extraordinary time in, in the west coast of America. Um, we spent a lot of time going up to San Francisco. Jordan Belson, the experimental filmmaker, we showed him a little bit of the end footage. Uh, Stuart Brand, who started the Whole Earth Catalogue, he, um, he did a screening of 10 minutes of George's footage in San Francisco and people were cheering and so we realised that we were making more than a surfing film, we were trying to make a kind of abstract film about the world and, and nature and things and, and so when we were doing the voiceover for it, we couldn't have a narrator and yet we didn't want George talking all the time yeah. so we we tried to just get George and I just went into a recording studio on Santa Barbara and grabbed little bits of to tease you and then you have to kind of look at the film and at times it might seem slow but you have to immerse yourself in the detail of what he was doing so that was the kind of style of film we were making and um, and it was like a, a, an extension of Morning of the Earth and and the innermost limits of pure fun in terms of its style. Yeah, and it seems like, I mean, the, I'm glad you mentioned this, but the sort of the ecological narrative that, um, that emerges throughout the film and then kind of culminates with this, this Pink Floyd sequence at the end is, um, is, I think, you know, really captivating, but it's also something that, you know, continues to resonate with surf culture and the sort of this, um, the importance of ecology. Um, and so, you know, I'm curious how you see how you see this kind of continue to resonate in, um, you know, in surf film or in, um, or sort of in the, the film's cultural impact? Well, unfortunately, 50 years on, the planet's in much worse shape. Yeah. Um, Tracks magazine, the first edition had a picture of the Newcastle Steelworks on the front cover. I mean, it was a surfing magazine. It had a very strong ecological, countercultural element in it. Um, that period of time look, was everybody thought we could change the world. Um, and George, in his own way, changed the world by just doing things in a very original manner. Um, unfortunately, we've all failed. And let's hope that Greta and her young friends around the world, the whole movement to try and save the planet, can start to gain some momentum again. Um, because we're really in bad shape right now. and. Uh, I think is very depressing, but George, I think George is an eco warrior, but he would never see himself as that because he's mostly, I think, an original Renaissance man. Yeah, and I, th I mean, I think it's also sort of, an, you know, an interesting component of the kind of, 
um, you know, the specificity of the of the place. Um, you know, and you're shooting in in one location as opposed to a you know kind of doing a surf travelogue or something like that. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, like in the in the process of of making this film, or you know, just in the sort of in the process of being here, what was your you know ex experience with the sort of the surf culture of of Santa Barbara, did you kind of get to meet the locals, as it were, and you know, and, and sort of see what was going on at the time? Well, uh, the crowds were one thing. Yeah. Um, you know, things were crowded, and and I mean, it was a whole new world to us. I mean, going to George's house, his father had a a glass ticker tape machine in the bedroom with a stock exchange coming out on a tape, <laughs> and in the back garden where the boat was built, George lifted up this, uh, unscrewed this lid and went down and there was an um, atomic bomb safety shelter oh, in right. the back garden. <laughs> Obviously someone had gone around and sold those to every person in Montecito. Um, so it was, uh, you know, it was, it was an interesting culture and uh, as I said, we spent weekends and things, we go to San Francisco, we're very friendly with the people from Rolling Stone. The music that was happening here was fantastic, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't the surf. I, I was very lucky that um, Hal Jepson, who's no longer with us, who was a great um, surfing filmmaker, um, befriended us and helped us out. And we, we actually um, stayed down at his house at Topanga Canyon for the first three months. And then we moved into Carpinteria and lived on an okay. avocado plantation. And, <laughs> and life was, you know, you'd go to the surf and then you'd hike up into the mountains and there'd be 20 naked people in a hot spring and you <laughs> thought, wow, we're in California. This is pretty good. Uh, there's this, uh, this interesting bit in the film where you, you sort of, you visit this Hollywood production of, uh, of a surf film. Um, we were kind of talking about this earlier, but you know, it's, it strikes me that there's these, these two pretty different understandings of, of surf as a, as a cultural phenomenon at the time. And so I'm curious, you know, how did the sort of the California scene that you'd arrived at compare to, you know, the sort of the reception of surf as a, as a sort of a cultural form in Australia? Maybe to, to both well, of you. Well, Garth would be interesting on that, but the, just on the, um, the, the Hollywood thing, I mean, the misunderstanding of what it was. I mean, yeah. that, was, that was sort of Hollywood at its extreme. And of course, you know, here you've got films like, you know, Gidget and Frankie Avalon movies, which yeah. was celebrated surf. And then you've got, you know, John Severson's Pacific Vibrations, which the best poster ever. Um, and then you've got McGilvray Freeman with Five Summer, Summer Stories that are really making films that are like sports documentary, yeah. fairly straight down the line films. And then Hal Jepsen's um, See For Yourself has a little bit of cosmic in it, and then George, who's very cosmic. Yeah. So you've got a very, very wide of breadth course. of yeah. surfing films happening here. And of course, you know, Bruce Brown's The Endless Summer, who it's a travelogue film, but it is so brilliantly done. Yeah. And yeah. of course, Bruce's wit was fantastic. I mean, so very sharp. Yeah. he came to um, Sydney and uh, Bruce Brown and the surf was flat, so he rounded up the local guys and at that moment invented the, exp the expression, you should have been here yesterday. <laughs> so out of a flat surf, he made a, a funny sequence. And yeah. I mean, he, was an ama he is an amazing filmmaker, Bruce Brown. He, he cut his surfing movie career by projecting films and doing live narration. And I remember he was at Manly Beach sort of put up the projector, put up the sheet, did the live narration, and it was all about Australia and Manly. And I'm sure if he was in Santa Barbara, the month, three months later, it'd all be about Santa yeah. Barbara. So he was an, you know, a great filmmaker and Endless Summer is, you know, arguably the greatest surf film ever made. But it's interesting, the breadth of it, the surf movie making, and, um, and in Australia we had Paul Witzig and Bob Evans, who also made lots of great surfing films. And Garth, you've sort of, you made the transition from, um, from Hawaii to California and then... Yeah, I grew up in Honolulu, and my father got the first degree in uh, PhD in marine ecology at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, San Diego, and so like in 1958 when we came, I already knew what that word meant, so, which was unusual at the time. 
and George actually introduced me to this area as the islands and the ocean here and the ranch and and um, and the the actual local marine ecology that he knew a huge amount about because he also was a lobster fisherman. He knew where all the fishing holes was. He knew all about the ocean. And he had it all connected together. And he took that knowledge with him wherever he went. I got the opportunity when I was um, about 10 years ago to work on the Marine Life Protection Act initiative and I and representing surfers. And partly because my name's the same as my father's, I snuck in under that little bit of patronage and was responsible with other people of, of putting the Marine Reserve that's out here off the campus. And those, all of them between Point Conception and the Mexican border, which, um, which, and we have to thank Governor Ronald Reagan paid for it and pretty much himself and his buddies because he wanted to go out with something that that was real that he had done, and in that I was I was always I was thinking about George a lot because he he just loved the ocean he was in it all the time he was like a fish himself and he knew about everything and how connected it was and I I um, I had one great course in my in my career at uh, UCSB, only one, and it was a botany course. I hope the professor is still here, where he, when you were done with that course, you felt you, like you knew everything about plants, period. And his tests were so easy to pass. Nobody forgot <laughs> anything he said. He was amazing. So when you take that, that kind of knowledge with the knowledge of the ocean that I had learned, I was always looking for people, and in Australia there were a lot of them and still are, who were interested in keeping the ocean alive. And I think that's a legacy that anybody who lives on the ocean is responsible because we want a clean ocean full of fish. That's it. It's really simple. And that's the message that um, George took with him everywhere he was. And that's, you know, that I think is, is the most basic um, the most basic gift that surfers have given to the world, if anything, it's that. The rest of it's fun, but pretty much everybody's united in that, in that feeling of connection to the ocean. Yeah, I think that, that question of legacy is really interesting as well. I mean, what do you sort of, well, I mean, before I ask that, um, I'm curious how, you know, how the sort of the film developed from, you know, this, this short biopic to something that was much more sort of poetic and ecological in scope. And then, um, you know, how it was sort of, so I understand it, it premiered at the Sydney Opera House kind of right as the Opera House was opening and then continued to develop um, into the, you know, the version that we saw today. Well, it, the, um, we were lucky enough that they built the Sydney Opera House and um, it was built by the government and there was an argument about how big the opera theatre should be and so they made it smaller and, where the, and they stuck a small 400-seat cinema in there. And we read about this in the paper. So we rang, I think Albie Falzon rang them up and said, oh, can we book the cinema? And they said, yeah, no one's booked it. So we booked the theatre in the Opera House when it opened. And of course, everybody in Sydney, in the world, probably wants, you know, the Sydney Opera House, this amazing building. And so needless to say, we could have shown a blank screen and we would have filled the place. But <laughs> with Pink Floyd and, and, um, and the surf movie, we, I think we played 15 sessions there and sold them out. <laughs> but we were we were struggling to get the film finished. So was surfing big in Australia at the at the time. Was surfing big in Australia? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Um, and and so then when 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 we I took the film to the Cannes Film Festival, and uh, we screened it in the marketplace, and it was like showing because with our surf movies in Australia and here, you went up and down the coast, and you had a projector in the back of your panel van, and you. <laughs> 
you put the posters under all the, the cars that were parked at the surf spots and then you'd show at such esteemed places as the Bungwall School of Arts in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> out of there'd be no one there and suddenly 200 people would turn up and you'd show your film. So um, showing surfing films had a great tradition and so when we ended up at the Cannes Film Festival, uh, it wasn't in competition or anything, we just put our posters up and down the street and I went to um, a printer and in my schoolboy appalling French, managed to get him to do a little handbill which was just a picture of the wave and it just said, Pink Floyd, no one has ever filmed here before in French. Yeah. And of course, everyone in France, in the Cannes Film Festival, was all looking for something new, uh, picking up this handbill and going, Sacre bleu, no one has ever filmed here before. <laughs> and uh, so in those days, they still had a few old cinemas in Cannes. Now they're all very small multiplexes, except for the Palais. And we just packed it out. Yeah. It was a fantastic feeling. And we sold the film to uh, an international distributor but they wanted more stories. So then we came back to Santa Barbara and we included, we recut the film and we put in a lot more scenes from Innermost Limits with the red board and the mat riding. And we were still limited for what we'd originally had, limited by, I should say. And then we recorded the voiceover. So that was the kind of evolution of it. Yeah, and you've continued, both of you have kind of continued to work with George. Uh, you two have continued to work together. How did working on Crystal Voyager sort of lead into other projects well, and to the work that you were doing? Well, well, George, I ended up then with Philip Noyce. I produced Newsfront, which he directed, and that was luckily for both of us a great success, which launched our feature film careers. And George worked on two more films I made. One was called Chain Reaction, which was a nuclear disaster movie. And I managed to get George 200 miles off the coast, which was a, a difficult task. And <laughs> Dr. George Miller, who directed the Mad Max films, was doing second... I got him to be the executive producer on Chain Reaction and direct the second unit, Car Chasers. And George was the cameraman on it. So I had Dr. George Miller and George Greeno. And George was made, because he was so good at making all these little camera rigs, he made all these camera rigs for the car chasers. And that was very exciting for me because I was not only the producer but the first AD on it. So I learned off the master George Miller how to do those things. And then uh, uh, I did a film called Black Rock, which is about the surfing community in Newcastle and a teenage girl being murdered at a party. And it's quite a serious film, but there was a whole surfing sequence in that. So again, um, I produced that film. It was directed by Steve Weidler, but George came and shot all the surfing sequences for me. So, um, and George, of course, did Big Wednesday. He shot all the water stuff for that. Um, a quick anecdote, there was a, an Australian film called Cool and Gatter Gold, which was about uh, Iron Men. And uh, there was a whole sequence where they were paddling surf skis in the ocean. And uh, they were towing a barge out to sea with all these people standing on the barge with, you know, continuity and all the stuff. And of course, the, you know, the weather had changed, they couldn't do it. The, guy who was the actor couldn't keep up with the Iron Man who was paddling the other ski. It was just <laughs> hopeless and they were getting nowhere and the film was going down the gurgler. And uh, the grip, Ray Brown, who was a very funny um, guy from Devonshire in England, said, came up to the director, I Igor Owls, and said, Igor, you ought to get Elphick's mate Greeno. He's the only bloke that can do this. So they got George up there and George said, Ever, all of you go away. The two guys paddle their surf skis out to, out to sea. George put an eye bolt in the front of the actor's surf ski, attached a fishing line, went out there in a tiny little boat, got his <laughs> mate to drive the boat. George jumped over the side. Of course, the, the actor could then overtake the Iron Man paddling because he was being towed along by the fishing line yeah. and shot the sequence in one day. <laughs> That's but that's George, you know, innovative, as Garth was saying, he's so innovative and original. He's, he's, he, 
a great anecdote is he lives in Byron Bay. He came to Australia. I went there in 69 and he came in that, on that boat. He actually sailed that boat to Australia through all the islands of Tahiti. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, you wow. know how it had a, ra a retractable keel. I don't know if you noticed that. So he could drive it right up on the beach like a lifeguard boat or over reefs to get into the lagoon or whatever. And he, um, when he got to Australia, he quickly made a name for himself as a shark killer. There were um, some of the remote surfing spots there were occupied by sharks. And he had a, an old land cruiser with a winch on it with a steel cable. And he'd paddle out on his mat with a, something dead big with a giant hook and a steel cable and drop it in these surf spots and catch a shark, you know, big ones like that big around. And, um, and crank them into the shore with his, with his winch kill them, chop them up, go back out, take all the pieces and throw them there. And if the sharks didn't leave, he would do it till they were gone. This is at Double Island Point in northern Queensland. And he lives in a house shaped like a pyramid where his bed, he's extremely eccentric and funny. You have to, I have to laugh when I talk about him because he's, he likes to shock people. And that film at its time was really shocking because very few people had even been in the tube, much less seeing what it feels like. And these are big waves. A lot of the um, shots are at razors up on a really big day. They're big, heavy waves, all of the brown, ugly ones. And we were just holding our breath, you know, trying to try not to, um, to pass out watching them when it came out. It was, it was, it shocked the whole surfing world and other worlds. Anyway, he's in this pyramid thing and he's got his bed set exactly where Tutankhamun's tomb was so that he gets the, the direct projection of the vibes from a pyramid that are going to make you live forever, which didn't work for King Tut, and it probably won't work for George, but he'll try it. You know, he'll try anything. And Dave's got a great story about, um, in Australia, brown snakes are the most dangerous thing. And he, he's a thrill seeker, and he, I, I collected snakes too, so... We're both snake lovers, but nobody loves a brown snake because they're deadly. They're not even slightly afraid of you if it's there on the path. When it sees you, it just goes, yeah. Well, well George yeah. lives in the bush at Broken Head in, yeah. in this pyramid, and he never wears any shoes. And um, <laughs> he'll, he'll go to the airport with no shoes and then put them on as he goes through customs. and. And I, I said, and someone said, why didn't you wear shoes? Someone at customs and he said, oh, I found a spider in a shoe once. You know, shoes are no good. He's very <laughs> suspicious of them. But um, he never wears shoes. And I said, George, you know, there's a lot of brown snakes here. He said, oh, yeah, they're in the house all the time. And I said, he said, the trick is when you tread on them is to lift your foot up quickly. Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. But he, yeah. um, he's, so he's, uh, he's made another film called Dolphin Glide, a little short film since Crystal Voyager. But um, he's also, I, he was talking about, he was going to make a film called The Lazy Gardener. And that's because um, he decided to grow organic vegetables. So he went and got huge earth moving tires and slit them down the middle. So they were like two circles. And then he piled them up, up the hill and then drilled holes where they in, overlapped each other, filled them up with soil, put organic vegetables in them. And then he could use every drop of water by watering her at the top. And then the water would go down through this kind of Big. waterfall of old tyres. So he's a, quite an extraordinary and very entertaining friend that... Um, you don't so much have conversations with him, do you, Garth? He sort of does a monologue and then you change the subject and he gives you another monologue. The whole time, yeah. <laughs> but he's such a great guy and he's 77 now and he still surfs every day, fishes every day and, um, and rails against the world, which is pretty good. <laughs> Well, I want to ask about that camera because it's, you know, it's something that we almost kind of take for granted now in the, sort of in the age of GoPros, but that, you know, that footage that he's getting and, you know, the, the time period that he's, he's getting it in is just, is, is amazing. Well, the, the first one weighed 28 pounds. Can you imagine surfing in a wave with a 28 pound camera on your back? Hmm. And when he shot the coming of the dawn, he actually had lights on his back as well. And, set, and he'd be out there before dawn. Several times he was knocked unconscious and washed up on the shore oh, with geez. a camera on his back. Wow. He used to 
he used to take the footage, get it processed. He lived in a tent at Lennox Head. As only George would, he had a piece of lead that he put nails in and he'd hold the original film up to the light and then cut it with a razor blade on this piece of lead with the nails in it to get the frame line right. Um, no wonder there's a few scratches on the film. You know. and he, I, it didn't, wasn't really clear in the film, but he made those, those underwater cases himself. He made the, set the fiberglass, he put in the eyepieces, he made the little things that you could see, so you could control it from the outside. He made the face plates. He invented the glue to put them on. He, he did the whole thing. And he would do it like, you know, like anybody could do it. His favourite thing was the Army War Surplus Catalogue, Army, Navy and Air Force. And he found this um, camera, which is out of a bomb site of it, because it was during the Vietnam War, an F-111 plane. And he got a hacksaw and hacksawed off the armour plating case. But it was mounted this way, the way the, the, the film fed. So he adjusted it so, it, so the, the film ran horizontally and then built a fibreglass casing around it. And he's the only person that Panavision ever let hack one of their cameras in half and build a casing for. Because you, when you hire things from Panavision, you're never allowed to damage the equipment. So George is the only one who, who was allowed to do that. And the fisheye lens, he drew it himself and got Century Optics to make it. Really? Yeah, so it was, he, he designed that lens. Huh. Yeah, but yeah. he, um, I mean, when we were doing the re-edit for the 35 mil blow up, uh, he said, you've got to lay up all the sound. And, you know, I didn't know how to lay up the sound, but he kind of showed me. And I said, well, where's the clock leaders? He said, oh, you don't want to waste money on clock leaders. We'll just get a bit of old black film and I'll get a hole punch and I'll put it in at three seconds. So when you see the hole come through, you can do sync. So anyway, we turn up in Hollywood to do the mix. <laughs> and the guy comes in, you know, surfing movie and he looks at George has got no shoes on, you know, and his hair is <laughs> out like this. And he, and he looks at it, there's no leaders, you know, he's absolutely yeah. furious. And <laughs> so he's thinking, oh, how long is this going to go on for? And I think we'd, for the whole mix, we'd booked like three hours or something because that was all we could afford. Anyway, the minute he saw the footage, the guy was converted and anyway, he gave us a day for nothing, which was good. But that was George, everything, you know, don't buy a clock leader, make the leader yourself. That's the way he looks at life. And that high speed camera was the camera that was in the bombers in Vietnam, they were taking the pictures of the bombs exploding and it was 220 frames a second or something. Oh, it was wow. super high speed and he figured that out and, you know, he did what Dave said. He went and got a surplus one and turned it into a camera to shoot the film that you saw. Wow. So, and after that, all the other cameramen did the same thing. They all got that camera, Jack McCoy and the Bud Brown, and they all went for that same high speed camera to do those slow motion shots. I like the sort of the sort of the DIY sort of recuperative, um, you know, sort of aesthetic of the film, but also the sort of the ethos that that surrounds uh, that surrounds all of the sort of the you know um, the things that George was making, but also the sort of the um, like this the sort of surfer ecology of you know like building a board and you know and and really kind of getting your hands in there. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that camera, when you think that it could only take 100 foot loads and a normal film goes through at 24 frames a second, it was going through at 400 frames a second. So the load went, re it, 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 you'd get one shot and then you'd have to paddle back and shore, yeah. Open unbolt, change, yeah. you know, it, it had like 40 bolts to bolt the thing up, take it to pieces, you know, black bag, put another 100 foot load in, go out. I mean, oh, extraordinarily my. tenacious. So yeah, what, what we saw in that last 23 minutes took, like he, he's saying, every single one of those shots was a trip to shore and yeah. back. And it, was, it wasn't 23 years, but it was hundreds of times of what you saw in the end. Yeah. And, he and of course, now you've got a GoPro and you can just, yeah. you know, amazing. He, he did it to please himself. To me, was my, my, my take on George as a good lesson for artists that he, um, he just, was making himself happy with what he did, you know, he was, and he was accomplishing things. And then he would try, you know, if he had one or two fans, you know, that, that was enough. You know, he wanted to show it to people he thought would appreciate it, but he wasn't ever looking for any kind of um, 
glory. Like David said, he didn't want his name on the film. Um, he was he was a self entertained person. And he was not very in, interested in women or money too, so he had a lot of extra time compared to most people. <laughs> um, to you know, to be creative, he was very very focused, per man, and and it it. Um, I like seeing this film get around because there, it encourages you to go out on a limb. And George was on the limb all the time. I mean, to get on that boat with him, I would never, I, you know, I could never have done it. It, it t takes a huge amount of bravery and physical toughness to hang out with George on those trips to the island. Yeah. <laughs> that little boat with the cover over it that looks so good, it's just, you know, it's like this, and you're bouncing off the roof, and your things are Oh, going everywhere. to the Channel Islands, brutal you know, in that. Four hours, oh. and then it's surf all day, and try and come back with the wind, and you just, the you get off the boat, and you just, is. you feel like a rubber man. <laughs> there's, there's nothing left of you. It's incredibly tough. And I don't know how he survived in Santa Barbara without shoes, because I'm a cold person, but it's, he did, summer and winter. Well, I think that's, you know, the, the cool thing about the film is it kind of captures, you know, it captures him and it captures this, you know, this moment in the history of surfing in a really interesting way. Um, and I, you know, that was kind of how I, I, I found the film for the first time. Somebody was like, you have to watch the displacement hall sequences with Richie West. And so I was searching for those and, and happened upon the film. And I was like, oh, this is a, you know, a fantastic Santa Barbara surf movie. And so, you know, I'm curious what you sort of think about in terms of the sort of the legacy of the film and, you know, and how it's, it's, you know, relates to surf culture, but, you know, relates to sort of filmmaking more broadly. Well, the great things about film is they record a point in time and, you know, we, we lost Richie West this year and, um, but there he is up on the big screen in yeah. Santa Barbara, still dancing on a wave. So that's probably the greatest thing about films is they record a point in time, isn't it? He was a big, Influence on Tom Curran, who's a Santa Barbara surfing champion, and also Nat Young, who you saw in there. Um, and Nat's two sons, who are great, great surfers. And a lot of the best surfers today, Ryan Birch, um, the really good ones learned to ride finless boards. They learned to ride mats. They ride blocks of foam with nothing. They ride Elias. They ride skim boards. He, he's the person that, that made made surfing be really about riding waves. It's not about what you do on it so much. And the other comment I want to make as an old timer is that the days without a leash were, you'll notice how careful they were going. And George was a surfer too, but he hated it when he lost his board. And so he went to these things that he'd got two hand that were easy to hold on to. And you watch Nat surf and they're, you know, they're not going above the wave because if you lose your board at Rincon, or at the ranch or razors anywhere. You come into the fins broken off. The thing you had in your car always was a kit to put your fin back on. And it was, and Rincon was crowded, but on a big day, you could, you know, boards were against the rocks. People were putting fins on. Set would come and there'd be four people out for 20 minutes. It was, <laughs> the, the leash made modern surfing because it allowed you to, to try things where you lost your board. And in those days, it was the guy who, stayed on the board, was the best surfer. And George stayed on his board more than anybody because he was on it with two hands and two feet. And so he did, you know, he developed all those kinds of turns where you getting in the tube, tube riding and going off the lip and turning really hard at the bottom and kind of not caring what happened next where everybody else um, was just wanting to make the wave yeah. and get back out and not freeze to death because there were no wetsuits either. So. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so I'm sure our audience has a, a bunch of really good questions for you as well. Um, so we're going to open it up to, to the audience for a few questions. Um, Hi. I was wondering if you could describe your favorite surf session with George Greeno. Both of them. Yeah, either, either of you guys. Well, you know, there isn't. There isn't any, there's no such thing as a surf session with George Greeno because George was on his own at all times. And he is, and he, for instance, at Rincon, he'd paddle out sometimes all the way around the point, come in, and he wanted to surf the indicator and make it through that long, hard section to get through. 
and go all the way there. And he wasn't a person that, in my experience, that when he wasn't really your pal when you were in the water, he was, <laughs> he was just out there riding the waves. He wasn't a wave hog either, but when he went, he went all the way, you know, and then he'd walk back out and jump in. So it wasn't, you, at least me personally, I never felt that, that um, and he also traveled by himself, you know. I never once got in a car with George and went. It was him and his cop car with all of his equipment and everything else. He was sort of, he was, he was a recluse in a lot of ways. I, I remember we were editing um, the movie and uh, at Palm Beach and we, um, we went out at uh, Baron Joey, which has got quite a strong rip. And uh, my girlfriend, Lisa, was, who George was very friendly with, she went for a swim and I was on a board and George was on his, um, I think he was on a mat. And um, anyway, Lisa got in a rip and she started being washed out to sea. So I paddled out to help her, but we were sort of going out to sea and then suddenly George just kind of motored over the horizon with those fins on and it was like he had an outboard motor and we thought, well, we're out in George territory now and he just got behind us and like pushed us in as if we were, as if we had a, an outboard motor and I thought, you're out there in George's country when you get out the back. <laughs> so we saved both of us. So how much time did you guys spend shooting in Montecito during the process of making the film? How long did it take to sh actually shoot? And also, can you confirm or deny that George discovered Chopu? Discovered what? Chopu? Uh, n not to my knowledge. Um, uh, and uh, we were in, I think we we're in America for a total of six months. So, um, and we filmed, I think, for about four months. But of course, a lot of the footage, all the end of the film and all the Greeno shots through it were all, weren't shot during the shoot of the film. So Correct. the shoot of the film was when Nat and Richie were there and the building of the boat and the launching of the boat. Um, that was the, and then everything else was stock footage, you could say, or archival footage. Hi. Can you talk about how you got the rights to the Pink Floyd song and the deal you made? Well, um, the Pink Floyd song, uh, as I, I earlier said, how they'd heard, heard of George. And um, we were at George's house one day and his mother, Helen, came home with the metal album. And she said, oh, I found this in the record shop and it, the cover looks like one of your shots. It's a, it's a blue cover with like, looks like water. Uh, it's not a tube shot, it's just like an abstract blue cover. And she just bought it because she thought it reminded, and so George put it on the record player and started editing film to it. And it just seemed to be a natural, because it's such a, you know, 23 minutes of music like that is such a great music scape for a, for a visual artist to work to. Um, so we thought this would be great, but the problem is the Pink Floyd at that stage had just released Dark Side of the Moon and were the number one band in the world. So um, as the producer of the film, I took off on the last airfare that we had for London to meet the Pink Floyd. So um, I went in and they kind of vaguely knew about because they'd seen the footage at the Yellow House in Sydney a couple of years earlier. So they said, well, come and look at what you've got. So I hired a little um, theatre in Wardour Street in London and I had the, the 33 vinyl rotating of, of echoes and the guy had a 10, 10 minutes of spliced, tape spliced together George footage, which I was praying would not break in the projector, and uh, 16 mil. So I dropped the record on and the Pink Floyd had arrived in their Rolls Royce and they're all sitting there in the theatre. Anyway, um, they looked at it and it finished and I thought, what are they going to say? And Dave Gilmore got up and said, it's all right, but next time make it louder. <laughs> and uh, so um, Steve O'Rourke, the manager, said, well, you know, unusual. The boys never let their stuff out, but, you know, it looks like you've got a deal. Come back, we'll talk terms. So. I went back to their palatial office in London and um, 
he said, right, um, how much, you know, 23, it's a lot of music, 23 minutes. And I said, well, uh, I actually haven't got any money. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, what are you wasting my time for? And I said, well, look at what George did. I said, he did for surfing what Pink Floyd have done for pop music. So let's do a swap. And I said, we'll give you some footage you can back project on your American tour. And you give us the footage, you give it, not exclusive, but we can use it in our film. And he said, deal. Um, well, so, so with that, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to the Carsey Wolf Center um, and Emily and Patrice and Matt for helping us bring, uh, bring the film. Um, uh, George just wanted me to say that he would have liked to be here, but he couldn't find his shoes. <laughs> Please, please join me in, um, in thanking Dave and Garth uh, for traveling all this way. Um, this is very exciting. Thank you, guys.